Hello everyone. How's everyone doing? Had a little glitch before going online. <laughs> uh, the glitch was that my computer started doing updates on, I think it was Firefox or whatever. And so uh, a bad moment to, to have that done, you know, just automatic. And so it took like 10 minutes there to, to get back into, you know, I had to turn the computer off, back on and so on. Anyways, um, um, today I'm going to be talking a little bit about mathematics. Well, the reason, you know, I've been wanting to do that for some time now, and it's like I never got a chance. And so today I'd like to begin a little mini series. And, you know, uh, you probably heard some comments about me, about people out there. Then they, uh, they, they, you know, analyze me and they have their opinions. And one of the comments you'll hear about over there is uh, out there is um, that, um, you know, the reason I hate mathematicians or that I uh, and I'm against uh, mathematical physics is because um, I hate math. You know, I uh, don't understand math, and so I hate it. <laughs> and uh, really nothing could be further from the truth. I've taken my good share of math courses. In fact, they should have figured that out. <clears throat> uh, you know, I'm an engineer. I had to take many engineering courses. And when you take engineering, when you go into the engineering field, <laughs> you're forced, you're compelled to take math courses. It's, it's part of the curriculum, so you cannot avoid it. And, um, you know, when you're at the university also, uh, you know, whether you take uh, engineering, lawyering, doctoring, whatever you, whatever you study, uh, you have requisites, right, part of the uh, curriculum, and then you have your electives, maybe 20, 30 units, depending on the uh, college, right? And, um, you know, you, you, you can select anything you want. And a lot of people, you know, they, they've got their hands full with, with their major already. So what happens is, um, you know, they take sewing and cooking to pad their degrees. And for electives, I took math courses. Tell you a little secret, I've got, a, as a result, I've got a math minor. Got a minor in math. And um, I also, uh, you know, once you work out there, uh, you're in the, um, I, I was in the semiconductor industry, you know, you work your way to higher levels. You go from engineering, what's the next step? Well, you go to managerial levels. And I ended up being a manager at AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. And, um, uh, you know, when you, when you get to those levels, uh, you don't really need your engineering skills, or you don't do as much engineering. You need to, to understand it, but you don't do as much. And what you do instead, you do more administrative work and you have to deal with people. And so, you know, um, I went in and got a uh, bachelor's in economics as well. And so, um, and when you study economics, you take macro, micro economics, uh, you got to do a lot of calculations. And uh, you take a lot of uh, math as well in there. So, you know, you, you got to cal calculate curves and so on. And, you know, it's, it's just a lot of math. And so people don't always understand that <laughs> when you go to college, if, if you're going to go into science, you know, I got, to, got a bachelor's uh, in science uh, for economics. And uh, when, when you go into science, when, when you take courses like engineering, economics, and so on, uh, you swallow a lot. Uh, uh, when will I go back on public space? I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me continue here. Um, the, the issue is, you know, you take a lot of math. You have to take a lot of math, whether you do engineering or you do economics. And um, so all I want to say is, you know, uh, 
I'm very familiar with math. In fact, I was going to take, when I was doing my minor for math, I was planning on turning it into a major. But it turns out that, you know, when you're out there uh, studying all this, all these math courses, and I really enjoyed math, uh, you know, I, I didn't take it because I was forced to. Like I'm saying, I took them as electives. You know, and you don't find too many people that take math as electives and get a minor in math. Um, and, uh, you know, when I was taking these courses, they, they got so abstract at some point that I said, well, do I really want to continue with this? Do I want to, you know, pursue a career in mathematics? Thank God, you know, <laughs> uh, the good Lord contacted me and <laughs> thank you, God. And he said, you know, don't get in there in that field. Otherwise, I'd be today maybe, t uh, you know, trying to convince you to believe in black holes and Big Bang and, you know, dark matter. Fortunately, you know, they told me, uh, they told me, uh, you know, God came up and he uh, enlightened me and <laughs> I went in a different direction. Okay. And, uh, I think it was good. Also, you know, I, I, you, many of you know, I've been, I uh, was three years in prison and during those three years, I did a lot of math because I did a lot of investigation on physics and so on. Spent a lot of time on that. I did a lot of equations. You look at all my notes, which I keep to this day. It's just equation, 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 equation. I was trying to figure out things like, you know, uh, permittivity and uh, permeability and how they related to each other. I did a lot of calculations. So, so I'm very, very familiar with math. Okay, I'm very much in touch. Now, you know, it's been a while now. I, I don't care about math that much these days. But you know, I, I used to uh, I used to do lots of math. I want you to know that. Okay. So when people you know cuss me out and they say hey, he doesn't like math and that's why he, or he doesn't understand it, you know, and that's why he rails against all these mathematicians. Well, it's it's not true. But I let them have their say. Just let them get it off their chest. Okay. So I want to do a little math. Uh, but you know, I do understand that. Um, 99.99 percent and that's a mathematical exact value okay 99.99 percent of people don't care a damn about math and they get bored with math it's very boring for for most people um so so what i want to do is uh you know i don't want to do equations here when i say i'm gonna be uh, talking a little bit about math in the coming uh, presentations coming lectures I mean that, you know, I want to relate it to physics and I want to make it entertaining, as entertaining as I possibly can. I mean, how, how entertaining can you make math, right? Uh, but, you know, my, my point is I want people to uh, listen how it's related to physics, where we came up with stuff like, you know, black holes and Big Bang and dark matter. You know, where do we come up with all this stuff? And obviously, you know, we have this uh, discipline called mathematical physics. And they've kind of trying to blend them in there. In fact, uh, you know, when I was figuring all this stuff out in prison, I had the same idea. I, I thought the way to reach an understanding of the universe was through mathematics. And that's why I did a lot of equations. And at the end of the <laughs> this uh, journey that I set out, because I was really trying to figure it out, uh, you know, I came to the conclusion math has nothing to do with physics. That was my conclusion. You know, it was like using the wrong tool for the uh, purposes that, you know, I was embarked on. Okay, so let's start with a uh, little bit of math here. And a good place to start is to know, you know, math is about numbers, right? So what is a number? Well, I'll give you a very quick course. You stay, what is it, maybe 20 seconds You'll learn all you need to know, to know about mathematics uh, numbers, at least, right? Here they are. Okay, here it goes. Um, you know, these are the different types of numbers that we have. Okay, and you have natural numbers. You say, what is a natural number? Integers, rational numbers. What are all these categories? Do we need them? I mean, what are they? And natural numbers very easy. It's just numbers from one upwards. No decimal points, no, just just uh, counting numbers, right? You count apples, those are your natural numbers. Integers are the same thing, but you got the negative numbers and you include zero. Uh, in the case of natural numbers, sometimes they do include zeros, okay? 
And uh, when you uh, see others um, like rational and irrational, you say, what do you mean rational? How can a I thought mathematics was all rational. Well, not true. You know, you do have irrational numbers, but it doesn't mean what, what we usually use the word irrational for. Rational numbers are, are those that have an ending. In other words, that uh, like there I give an example, 5.346, and that's where it ends. Okay, that's a rational number. Uh, three quarters, that's 7, 0.75, you know, any way you want to uh, uh, represent that, also a finite number. Minus eight, that's a finite number. But when you get to irrational numbers, you get to numbers that uh, don't repeat themselves. In other words, the decimal points, uh, the string does not repeat itself. And it just, you can say infinite, just goes on and on and on forever. And those are known as irrational numbers. Okay? Real numbers, they include both. The, you know, the uh, rational and the irrational. Essentially, anything you can fit on a number line any portion thereof. And we don't care, you know, if uh, uh, pi is exactly 314 because we round it off to 314 anyways. So, you know, the, all those millions of decimal points after uh, the 314, it's just, uh, you know, for mathematicians who want to see, you know, want to see how far it goes, that kind of thing. It's not for normal people. <laughs> okay. Imaginary numbers where you have a square root of minus one. And you multiply that times anything you want. Like in the case of complex numbers at the bottom, it's a mixture of real plus imaginary. You want to take the square root of minus 9, you separate them in minus, square root of minus 1 and square root of 9. 1 is 3, right? Uh, square root of 9 is 3. And you multiply that times square root of minus 1, and you replace that square root of minus 1 with the letter I, which stands for irrational, and just say 3I whatever that means, <laughs> okay? And that's a complex number. So that's how they use imaginary numbers and, uh, and you know, how this all ties in. Those are the different categories. Now you're an expert, okay? That's how simple this thing is. It's just a bunch of stuff that uh, you don't need to know. You probably just need to know the natural numbers for the rest of your life, okay? You know, I, I, I want to tell you something about that, you know, when... Uh, I studied tons of math, calculus, one, two, three, uh, linear um, uh, algebra. I mean, I, I took a lot of stuff. And uh, it turns out I never used it outside the classroom, okay? Never, never used it. The only thing I took uh, that was of very, <laughs> very much use, and not only for me, but for all the engineers, it was um, uh, statistics. You do need statistics if you're going to run an operation. You need to know your control limits uh, or to determine your control limits, your reject limits. You need to do calculations of that nature. And, um, yeah, you also need to uh, know what a variance is, what st uh, standard deviation means, etc. You need to know all those concepts and you use them daily. They, they, you use a lot of that. Calculus, you never use it in your life. I never never used calculus outside the classroom. I mean, if you work at NASA and you need to calculate, you know, the trajectory of a rocket, yeah, you're going to need it. But do you need it to, uh, you know, to, I don't know, to make a transaction, a commercial transaction? Do you need it to run an operation like the ones I ran in at AMD with semiconductor processing and so on? Never used it at all. Never whatsoever. So, you know, I studied all that math for nothing, in a way, and that was another of the reasons that I did not pursue a career in mathematics, okay? Um, uh, statistics, yes. That, and it's very, I personally like statistics a lot, you know, but uh, it's something you do need, okay? Okay, let's look at a little bit of the history of math. And again, I'm going to go swiftly through this because uh, the main point, I don't want to bore anyone. Okay, I'm trying to make this as sweet as possible. You just got the numbers, different kinds of numbers. Uh, you can go back and look at the tape again later on, and you'll, you'll get an idea, you know, how easy it is just to know what all these numbers mean. Here's a little bit of history. Uh, also, I'm going to try to synthesize it here in pictures. Okay, and, uh, you know, where did we get all this stuff? Uh, uh, you know, uh, where did we get math? numbers and so on. Uh, the first uh, official record that we have is the Ishango, Ishango or Ishango bone, and it was found by the Belgians in the uh, Belgian Congo. Today it's in the uh, Belgian Museum. 
And it's a, a baboon bone. It's got, uh, I think it's a fem femur. And it's got all these markings on it. And some people have calculated, you know, what those numbers mean, etc., uh, or those markings mean in terms of numbers, right? It, it, uh, there are different theories what those marks mean. Some people believe they are, you know, the phases of the moon uh, got to do with with moon with the uh, lunar phases in general. Other people, uh, there, there's this woman especially. Uh, she thinks those were the uh, menstrual cycles of a woman. <laughs> so uh, you take your pick. Those are two of the most important theories for that one. And this uh, bone originally was dated about 9,000 years ago. Then they redated it to about anywhere between 20 and 10,000 years ago. Uh, it's your guess again, you know, how much of this you want to believe. But uh, we don't really have um, a little more advanced math until we get to about 3,000 years before Christ. It's uh, uh, 3,300 years is, is a good number because it, it, it shows up in, uh, in uh, China, it shows up in Sumer, uh, um, it shows up in Stonehenge, and, and the way I look at it, and a little later in Egypt, but about around the same time. And I think all of these were related primarily, and that, this is my opinion. I think they were all primarily related to seasons and... Um, and to, uh, you know, they, 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 to, to astronomy. In other words, they were looking at the sky, they, were try they saw some patterns, and they were trying to figure out these things. And so that's where I think they, they started creating a notion of numbers of mathematics, of trying to, uh, you know, uh, put that order that they saw in some kind of uh, abstract form. And, um, uh, you know, Sumer uh, and also the, the others, uh, Akkad and uh, Babylonia, they developed these uh, symbols. Chinese, same thing, they developed their own symbols. Uh, each culture, the Egyptians also had their own symbols. And they all, uh, you know, started working with these numbers. And this was the, you can say, the origin of, of the symbolic representation in math in different cultures. Uh, Chichen Itza, the Mayans, um, they came out a little later, you know, quite a bit later, a couple thousand years later. And they, uh, if you look at, uh, they, they built this temple, right? The, the, these are temples that they built, unlike the um, pyramids of Egypt, which were tombs. Um, and they were in all these, uh, you know, like the steps on the uh, Kukul Khan uh, pyramid there, uh, you know, they're numbered. There's so many of them, and they all have to do also with the seasons. At least that's what the the theory is, because that's the numbers seem to match certain uh, certain patterns that you would think that the Mayans observed when they looked at the sky. Um, we get later. I'm just going to go right through this relatively quickly. We get to uh, about the uh, anywhere from the eighth to the eleventh century there. Uh, sorry, ninth to the twelfth century. Uh, Arabic uh, algebra was invented. Okay. And uh, you don't get until you get to Newton and Leibniz, uh, you don't get into uh, calculus. So that's more or less in a very quickly, you know, how this progressed over time. So you can see it's kind of uh, exponential. We, we, we found a need for it. Maybe we found a need for it because of technology. Uh, you know, originally when we invented uh, mathematics, it was for uh, assuming, you know, and this is again my opinion. Uh, maybe it was uh, for astronomy, for the seasons, that sort of thing. Then from there they went on to agriculture. You know, they settled down about 3,300 3, years ago, Mesopotamia, um, China, Egypt, etc. And um, th when they settled down, they started doing agriculture and they needed to uh, start counting things. Uh, they started uh, with trade. So they needed to keep uh, track of transactions. Government came into being and they started taxing. So taxes <laughs> started, uh, was a good reason to have mathematics, okay? Um, and then eventually, you know, we got more and more abstract with the mathematics, it just took off. And uh, you'll see some of that uh, when we get to here to the, um, let's see if I can get it in here, okay? 
uh, when we get to the Greeks and Romans, see here, here's the numbering system that the Greeks and Romans used, okay? Um, just symbols, just more symbols, different than uh, what you saw in uh, Mesopotamia and uh, China. Uh, they started playing around with the numbers and uh, getting a little cocky with them. They said, oh, what if, what if we squared the circle or double the cube? Uh, you heard of Zeno's paradox, the turtle uh, reaching the uh, finish line before uh, Achilles does because, you know, uh, Achilles only runs half the distance uh, every time he runs from uh, where he's at to the turtle. Uh, you got Pythagorean theorem. You've got people like Archimedes developing some weapons in Syracuse, um, catapults, and so on. Uh, all, all uh, designed, or, or at least he, he figured some of these out you know, with uh, mathematics. So you know they're they're starting to apply some of this, especially the Romans. The Romans uh, were not as um, abstract as the Greeks. The Greeks did a little abstraction. In fact, here you have. Uh, Plato, you know, he, he uh, had on his, supposedly he had on his academy uh, door, this sign that says, let no man ignorant of geometry enter here. Okay. So, you know, they, they, they started playing around with a lot of this stuff, the Greeks, but the Romans, you know, they, they were more engineering oriented, they were more practical, and they started using the numbers just to, you know, to uh, uh, build things or, or uh, geared towards technology. Okay? Uh, what comes next? Well, you get the uh, Indians and the Arabs, okay? and they also had their um, numerical system, and we eventually uh, borrowed, we can say, we borrowed the numbers from, especially from the Arabs who, I think, and again, this is my opinion, I think they borrowed it from the Indians. The Indians started uh, using these uh, numbers, these symbols for numbers, and you can see that by the ninth century, you see the, the number zero, which is the last one there on the left, second row. Um, the Arabs essentially just incorporated. And uh, it's, uh, I think, Albert Durer who eventually incorporates it uh, into material known in the West. Um, so you see the numbering system there. Whether this existed before, I'm not so sure, but uh, you can see that there is a progression from India through the Arab world into, uh, you know, the Western world. Uh, that's, I think, what the general flow of this was, partly because the Indians had some very good mathematicians early on. The Arabs were in touch with them, and they, uh, they flourished. Uh, right after uh, Mohammed, you know, did his revolution, they flourished for several centuries. Um, you know, the uh, the Muslim world expanded. You had the Os Osmanli, the um, the uh, founder of the Ottoman Empire. You know, they were pretty important in their days. They lasted for at least seven hundred years, where they were more or less strong. Then they faded away till they were, you know, second uh, first world war got rid of the Ottoman Empire completely. But during the time of their expansion, from around the eighth century, all the way to maybe the I'd say at least the sixteenth century, uh, eight hundred years, uh, the Ottoman Empire was very strong, and they had a lot of. Uh, scientists or researchers, mathematicians, physicists, and so on. And these people, you know, they, um, they developed math to very high levels. They did a lot of uh, studies in optics and so on, you know, Al Hazen. Um, so, you know, uh, this, it just evolved, in and we got it from them. The other thing you should keep in mind is that, you know, the um, Arabs rescued the Greek books you know, you, you have to remember the, uh, the Library of Alexandria that contained a lot of the uh, ancient Greek books and so on. It was destroyed, <clears throat> destroyed by fire. The Arabs somehow had copies or obtained copies, and they developed uh, lots of the ideas from Euclid and Plato and so on. They developed it over there. And then, uh, you know, we were in contact with the Arabs uh, for centuries. And, you know, we saw that they were an advanced uh, civilization. We borrowed the uh, West, Western Europeans, I call them. We because I'm a Westerner, right? We borrowed a lot of the stuff from them, and then we developed it much more than they did. Like, 
16th century, you have, you know, again, uh, uh, Western Europe is expanding. It's conquering the world with its ships and so on. And, you know, Europe flourishes. <clears throat> and it's because of that that we have a lot of this math today. Okay, um, uh, one important uh, uh, event that happened in the uh, 7th century, the uh, Hindus developed uh, the zero. Very important, uh, significant uh, development. And not only as a placeholder, you know, like uh, 10 or 100, but they started using it in operations. They said, you know, if you, especially as an identity type of thing, uh, element, uh, one plus zero is one, you know, one minus zero turns out also is one. You know, you divide zero by, by one, it's also zero, you know, and so on. Uh, and of course, uh, when you do it upside down, like <laughs> one divided by zero, well, that's, that's a separate story, okay? And then I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But, um, you know, uh, they developed uh, these numbers. We kind of copied it. And by the 19th century, you get all these uh, fine gentlemen, you know, these are some of the big names in mathematics for the 19th century. One of the things that the uh, first guy there, Richard Dedekind uh, and Giuseppe Piano did, uh, they, they uh, created, a, they formalized uh, arithmetic and mathematics, the number system, okay? And so they said, look, we, we have to turn these into axioms, something Euclid did not do. We, we can improve on him. And they did, and they went in there, or to some degree, I guess they did. Uh, they came up with, and there's two of their axioms. One is not a successor to any number. In other words, <laughs> one is the first number. <laughs> okay. The other one is uh, no two distinct numbers have the same successors. Okay. Essentially, no two numbers are alike. And that's, that's what they were saying. Uh, they tried to put it into a, a formal... Uh, axiomatic system. Uh, we have Mr. Lobachevsky and Riemann, uh, two of my favorites, because they deal with uh, relativity. Essentially, today we borrowed uh, uh, Lobachevsky's saddle uh, from him, and uh, you could say Riemann's ball. <laughs> and um, these guys, you know, they said, you know, what if we put a triangle on an uneven surface? And so uh, Lobachevsky came up with his uh, saddle triangle and Riemann came up with his spherical triangle. By the way, the spherical uh, triangle, triangle on a sphere was already discussed by the Indians um, at least, I would say, eight centuries earlier. So this was not, this was new to the West, but the Indians were already familiar with that. Another fellow, George, uh, Georg uh, Cantor, and uh, he worked a lot with infinities uh, ended up uh, the next century with uh, Hilbert's Grand Hotel, you know, uh, infinite rooms. And they, they started playing around with all these numbers and they said, you know, what if this and what if that? And they came up with axioms and so on. But it became very, very abstract. You know, they, they started working with infinity. What happens here at this limit? What happens at that limit? That, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, it's, it's for the very brave. <laughs> you really got to like that. I mean, you know, I like to do operations. I, I, I like to do calculus and so on. Uh, but when you get into all this abstraction, like, uh, you know, sets, set theory and uh, vectors and so on, I said, well, I don't think it's for me. It's too abstract. Okay, that's, that's the problem I've got with it. Okay, 19th century. Um, we had a very interesting development, which I think uh, gave a boost to mathematics, to the authority that mathematics is thrown in your face today. So keep this in mind. This is one of the places where it did happen. And it's uh, Mr. Urbain Leverrier. Okay, he's a French guy. And uh, I think it was 1845, thereabouts. Um, no, it was earlier than that. Like, I think it was 1836. And Leverrier was able to discover the planet Neptune. And he did so by showing, you know, he calculated mathematically before they even put their telescopes out there in the sky and found it. They, they went out there and they said, uh, and he said, uh, you know, there, something is pulling on Uranus. Uh, and so he calculated the mass. He approximated, you know, the location. 
And he says, you know, it's got to be something this big. It's pulling on Neptune. It's got to be like this. So he made all these calculations here from Earth uh, by simply looking through a telescope and saying, you know, this, this is where we should be able to find another planet. And sure enough, a German guy, can't remember his name, uh, something with, it starts with a G. He pointed his telescope in the sky, uh, more or less where uh, Le Verrier had predicted, and he found Neptune. It was a big deal in those days because here a mathematician had discovered something. He pr had predicted the existence of a planet before it, you know anyone saw it. And yes, sure enough, they found Neptune. What is the problem with this? Well, the problem with this, you know, well, yeah, I mean, you know, every year just got his name in lights and he became very famous uh, as a mathematician. And so people, uh, you know, approached him and says, hey, you're so smart. Why don't we do, why don't you figure out another problem that we're having? This problem was known, I think, for already 200 years, and that's that Mercury would has uh, its perihelion shifted. In other words, the, the, um, the orbit of Mercury was not a complete circle. It was uh, like uh, an oval that kept shifting around, like petals on a on a flower, okay. And so Lever here put his mind to it, and uh, he came up with what you see there on the right. And what he uh, said is, "Oh, I know. Just like there was a planet like Neptune pulling on Ju on um, Uranus, there's got to be some tiny planet out there that's pulling on Mercury, okay." And so uh, Lever here went out there, he did his calculations, he says, ah, there's got to be a small planet, some little moon in there, you know, between Mercury and the Sun. And they call this planet Vulcan. And they were in the search for many decades, they were searching for Vulcan. They said, it's got to be quite tiny, maybe very massive, but, you know, maybe it's all iron or whatever, or uran uh, uh, uranium, you know, <laughs> just very heavy planets, but small, so they couldn't see it, but they said there's something there that's, that's, uh, distorting the orbit of Mercury. Well, turns out there is no planet Vulcan. And so, uh, in retrospect, right, uh, we got a problem because mathematics cannot tell you whether there is a planet. Uh, you could also say that Le Verrier was uh, very lucky in that Neptune was found and that it was pulling on uh, Jupiter. Uh, could have been, uh, I don't know, some other star out there, for all we know. But yeah, he was right. Uh, Neptune was pulling on Jupiter, on uh, uh, Uranus, and uh, he was able to find it. But applying the same uh, system, the same mechanism, the same mathematics, he also predicted that Vulcan had to exist. And he was wrong there. And it tells you something about mathematics. You know, it tells you that he not, not always does mathematics predict because the physical interpretation, the explanation that you give something, does not necessarily concord with the mathematics. The mathematics, I'm not going to challenge. If the equation says this, okay, uh, you know, you measure and it's fixed, now you got to explain it, but there could be different explanations for the same phenomenon. And for sure, in this case, there was no planet Vulcan. And I think that's a good test to show that mathematics cannot tell you, uh, cannot explain things. It can describe, it can tell you, you know, this is, this is what we measured, this is the equation that represents what we measured, but it doesn't follow that your explanation of that, your physical interpretation of that is correct, okay? And uh, uh, the, the guy who went, you know, um, who figured out, you could say he figured it out. I got my doubts about that myself, but I'll, I'll just go along with, with the official version here. Uh, Newton said, you know, uh, how, how is it that Mercury goes around, you know, the sun? And according to Newton, it was more or less like that. Like, you know, this, he, he figured out that uh, using his equation that it had to be like Kepler more or less said, you know, all planets just go in uh, an elliptical orbit around the sun. Somewhat. It's, it's almost a circle here. It's exaggerated, but think of it as an ellipse. Uh, ellipse okay, that, that would be the best characterization of the, um, of the trajectory of the orbit. Um, Einstein came up. He uh, came up in 1915. He came up with a different idea. He says, well, you know, um, my equation is a little better than Newton's. 
okay? And mine can predict or mine can describe the orbit of Mercury a little better. And it looks more or less like that. And uh, you can see the, uh, how, how the um, perihelion is shifting, okay? How, how the entire orbit shifts. Okay, so those are the differences between Newton's and uh, Einstein's equation. But there's a more fundamental difference between these two, and I think you should, should understand that. It's important for you to understand what the difference is between Newton's equation and Einstein's equation. You hear about this, and you say, well, what's, what's the difference? Remember, Newton has mass times mass divided by distance squared. That means you take two masses, in this case, the Sun and Mercury, right? You look at the distance between them, and you do your calculation. So, well, you know, what is the force of attraction? You're trying to calculate the force of gravity that pulls, you know, from the Sun versus Mercury, knowing, you know, what the um, centripetal, centripetal uh, I'm sorry, centrifugal force is, you know, you say, okay, uh, I can put the mass times mass divided by distance square and calculate the force. Uh, Einstein's equation does something totally different. Einstein takes mercury, condenses it into a point. So you have a point mass, okay? And now he's going to calculate the orbit of the point mass, okay? Listen to this. Calculate the orbit of the point mass based on the fact that the sun weighs down space-time, bends the, the, the canvas, the, 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 the rubber sheet, okay? It deforms it. That's what he's calculating. He's calculating the deformation of space-time. And now this point mass, he's just going to calculate the orbit around it, okay? So whereas Newton says, look, you got a mass here, you got another mass here, and what's the distance between them? That's one notion, and he could not provide a physical interpretation for how that happened. Here you have a physical interpretation that says, okay, let's assume that space is a physical object. It's a bowl. It's a bowl because the sun weighs down the canvas, turns it into a bowl, and now we're going to calculate the uh, trajectory, the orbit, right, of a point mass. That's the conceptual difference between these two uh, equations, these two mathematical um, uh, representations of gravity, okay? And, uh, you know, last week, uh, or last uh, lecture, I talked about the pioneers, and both uh, Newton and Einstein fail. <laughs> and, of course, they're not willing to admit that, so they said, well, you know, the reason the pioneers are decelerating is they're shooting all this uh, heat in front of them. Well, that might be true, except for the fact that, you know, the Ulysses, the Cassini, and the Galileo probes, one goes to the sun, the other one went to Jupiter, the other one went to Saturn, they're all slowing down as well, or they slowed down some, some of these projects are over. Uh, but they, they all were measured to be slowing down as well, and they kind of brushed that underneath the uh, rug, okay? So it can't be that all these probes suddenly are slowing down, and we're going to still accept Newton and Einstein, okay? And I'm saying there is a reason for all this, and it's got to do, you know, again, as I explained last time, uh, you know, you got the bird speak situation, okay? As you get further and further out from the sun, you're going to enter the region where the bird speak gets narrower and narrower, and then at that point, I think that... Um, Newton's equation is not going to work just as well as it does, you know, here on Earth, in a, or near the sun, okay? I think there's, there should be a gradient as you move out of the solar system. In other words, if you get into the linear region between the sun and uh, Proxima Centauri, 4.3 light years away, you're going to get into that linear region where, you know, there is no tug, no acceleration of gravity. Neither Newton nor Einstein would work in that linear region. That's, that's what I'm saying, okay? Okay, let's move on here. Uh, here's another version of uh, Newton versus Einstein, just in case. You can see one is like a Rosetta-type pattern, whereas the other one is just uh, essentially an ellipse, just a... Newton's is the one on the left, okay? Okay, so let's move on here. We have now, uh, what is a number then? Let's go back to where we started. Here we have Euclid's definition of the word number. 
uh, book seven. He says a unit is that by is, is that by virtue of which each of the things that exist is called one. So that's unit is one. <laughs> okay, that's more like uh, more than a definition. It's just I'm going to say the word unit is one. And what is one? Well, it's a unit. It's like a synonym. It's like he's not. He hasn't uh, defined anything there. But then he defines the word number. He says, number is a multitude composed of units. Okay, so any number, what is a thousand? Well, it's a bunch of units. It's a bunch of ones. In fact, it's a thousand of them. <laughs> okay, so that's what his definition of number is. Uh, again, not very, not very um, enlightening. Uh, you know, you don't learn much with this. And the third definition, number is a part of a number, okay? The less of the greater when it measures the greater, okay? The less of the greater when it measures the greater. In other words, uh, if it's part of a number, it's uh, smaller than that number. Great. You know, it's, uh, again, not very, not very instructive, okay? Have we done any better since Euclid? I mean, what do we have today? Well, here's, here's today. Uh, here's a contemporary definition we have today. Uh, first one I like the most. <laughs> it's not a definition, but I thought I'd put it up there. It says, what are natural numbers? Natural numbers are physical. Look at that. He's saying they're physical, whether material or conceptual. So he's, he's saying that here that we have, you know, uh, something which is physical. And we have... Um, he continues, says, numerals obviously are physical. They are written on paper, and we calculate with them according to their written appearance on the page. I guess they're physical because you write a five on a piece of paper. My God. Mathematics at every level is concerned with physical form. Well, you know, again, I totally disagree with Mr. Spector, who has his the math page. You can find it on the Internet. Uh, has nothing at all to do with physics. Mathematics has nothing at all. There's no such thing as mathematical physics. Math is math. Physics is physics. Never the twain shall meet. Math describes, physics explains. Uh, and, you know, again, they're very different one from the other. Uh, Wikipedia defines a number as an abstract entity that represents a count or measurement. Well, I'm going to agree with the count part. I'm going to disagree with the measurement. You have five kilograms or uh, 10 seconds. Is that a number? Well, not in the way we define the word number. Number, we're referring to the, to the uh, uh, naked value. A five is a number, not five kilograms. Five kilograms is, uh, yeah, you can, it is a number. We call it number, but it's not the same thing as five. What we're trying to define here is the word number uh, at its more basic form. So you can say five is a number. Five kilograms is not a number under that context. So I'll disagree with the word measurement there. A word or uh, dictionary.com, a word or symbol or a combination of words or symbol used in counting or in noting a total. And again, you can see that they have not included the word measurement. They just said counting. Okay. So um, um, let's put this up there, which we need. What uh, my argument is, counting is not the same thing as measuring. And I give the example of mass. Measuring the elephant gives you its mass in kilograms or tons or whatever measure you, you want to have there. Counting the number of atoms that constitute the elephant uh, gives the number, uh, whatever number you put in there, a gazillion in this case, right? It could be a trillion atoms, could be a quadrillion atoms, I don't care. But the point is counting, saying 100 atoms, uh, does not equal saying, oh, uh, one kilogram, okay? Measuring is one kilogram. Uh, in this case, uh, you can also have measurements of time. You can have measurements of distance. Um, you know, you can have measurement of weight of uh, different different um, quantities out there. Measuring is not uh, the same thing as counting. And so, to say that numbers are all measuring and counting, no, numbers are only counting. Okay. And if that's the case, which is what my argument is, infinity is not a number. Infinity uh, means incessant counting. That's all it means. So, uh, you know, if, if, if the word 
number means to count, which is my argument, right? Then um, infinity under that uh, notion is not a number because all you're saying with infinity is you never stop counting. You never stop moving your hand up and down. How do they come up with infinity? Well, they said if, if we, we have one over two, right, and that gives me half, you have one over three, that gives me one third, and one over four, that gives me uh, a quarter, right, 1.25. Well, as the number in the denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger, like when here you have one over a thousand, right? Then your result, your, it always gets smaller and smaller and smaller, okay? And so they said, um, what is infinity? Well, infinity is the bigger the number at the bottom, um, the smaller is the result. And it just goes on forever, and it's called infinity. Okay, they, they just gave that name infinity and they represented it with a symbol, uh, uh, you know, uh, side, sideways or horizontal eight. And yeah, if you count the beads on your rosary, you're going to end up like that guy there, you know, in the nut house, because that's what some of these people like Cantor did, you know, in the 19th century. They just worked on infinities and on, on all these sets, infinite sets and so on, which very abstract. I'm not sure what, what uh, importance they have to reality. Okay, uh, my definition of number, here it is. Once again, for the purposes of science, uh, the word number is not a noun. It's not, it's a verb. It means to count. That's what the word number means. So if anyone wants to come into science, I'm saying, hey, you know, you got to define the word and, and wants to bring numbers in there. OK, fine. Bring the number in there. What, what do you mean by number? And I'm saying it means to count. That's my argument. Um, people can uh, fight me to the death. OK, <laughs> um, you know, but that's that's my version of the word number. It just means to count. It's a verb. OK, OK. And um, one of the questions that pops up is this uh, thing that the Indians invented in the seventh century, and that is the number zero. Is zero a number? And here you have Dr. Math, and he tells us what he thinks of, you know, the word, uh, uh, the, the number zero. He says, uh, the natural numbers are to be thought of as the counting numbers. You know, we, we talked about that at, at the beginning, uh, just numbers one and upwards, all the integers, all those are known as natural numbers. They're the counting numbers. And the numbers you use to start counting uh, a bunch of numbers, a, a bunch of objects. You wouldn't use zero to start counting, correct? Because if there are zero objects, you don't count them, correct? Someone could ask, how many pork chops do you have? And then you could answer with any counting number. You have one, two, three, whatever, right? And if you don't have any pork chops, you tell them zero. With all this in mind, I would still say that zero is definitely a number. Well, he never justified why. In fact, I think all his arguments showed that zero is not a number, okay? Uh, and again, all they have is this identity thing where you can do operations with zero in the sense that one plus zero is one, uh, one minus zero is one, uh, minus one, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, one minus zero is one, you know, or you can say minus one minus zero is also minus one. Uh, zero divided by one is zero. You know, this this identity notion is what brought zero in there. And it is a useful um, symbol. It allows us to do operations, no doubt about it. In that sense, you could say, yeah, uh, I'll count it as a number. But when you talk about numbers per se, when you try to define the word number, you cannot include the word zero or the symbol infinity because neither one, you know, you're not counting. In the case of zero, you're not counting. In the case of infinity, it just means, oh, you're counting incessantly. You're not referring to a number. You're just saying the activity of, of counting, one, two, three, four, five, gazillion, gazillion plus one, gazillion plus two, and so on down the line. It's not a... It's not a number that I can you do something with. It's just saying it continues on forever and never reaches a, a given value. So infinity is not in the number, neither is zero. Zero is only a placeholder. It's useful to do operations. Yeah, in that sense, you can call it a number. But when you define the word number to count, you know, you're, you're moving your hand, you're saying one apple, two, two apples, 
three apples and so on, you don't move your hand at all when you say zero. <laughs> and that's why it's, you know, you're not counting. And that's what number is. Number is to count. Okay. Okay. And uh, let's finish up here. Um, um, according to the Wikipedia, they also have an opinion on this. They say zero is a number. Let's see if we can stretch this out a little bit here. Okay. And their argument is that zero is a number is both a number and a numerical digit used to represent that number in numerals. Okay. Zero is an, an even number. Okay. So here we have an even number <laughs> simply because it forms, you know, like numbers like 10 or 100 or whatever. Zero is a number which quantifies a count. Or, uh, or an amount of null size. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know what a quantity of zero is. I don't know what an amount of zero is. And again, you know, uh, all these people are, are, are trying to fit that. They're, they're trying to fit two things. You can go through the rest of this. Uh, I'll just stop here with this one. But all I'm trying to say here is that, you know, uh, these people are using arguments that prove exactly the opposite or, or, or argue for the opposite. That zero is not a number. Zero is only a number when you use it in an operation or as a placeholder. No problem there. I have no problem in that context. But when you define the word number to count, you know, moving your hand up and down several times or whatever, zero is not a number because zero means that you're not moving your hand. And you do so for every other number, okay? And uh, and and again, it, it comes to also to another issue, and 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 that is, you know, is is a fraction or a negative number? Are those numbers? You know, um, negative is an operation, not a standalone number. But we converted into a number when we went into this thing of. Um, of using like Cartesian coordinates or the number line or whatever. Well, then we started saying, well, you know, we have negative one, negative two, negative three, and so on down the line. And you also have uh, three quarters and negative three quarters, negative uh, five tenths or whatever, you know, you get all these, uh, all these values there. And you say, well, aren't those numbers? Yeah, those are numbers. And that's why we have all these categories of numbers. But all I'm saying is when you define the word number, you know, you don't say three quarters. You don't count three. You only count uh, integers, the natural number, the counting numbers. That's what the, re the, I'll call it the real numbers, for lack of another word. Those are the true numbers, okay? Numbers are just integers when you're counting. All the others are used for operations, and they're, you know, they're useful for all kinds of things. I'm not saying they're not. I'm just saying when you define the word number, you can only use, uh, you know, the natural numbers, the counting numbers. Those are the true or genuine numbers. All the rest are just um, abstractions uh, that mathematicians use that are very useful, etc. Yeah, but they they are not related to the definition of the word number. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay, uh, and yeah, um, here uh, I'll just uh, end with this here where the zero is uh, not only zero, but the one is also, you know, they're used as identities, you know, and so on. So they're useful for, again, for um, operations. Uh, real numbers, if you add uh, or subtract zero, you know, uh, you get the, the, the same number back. If you multiply times one, no longer zero, but now times a one, you know, uh, is, is one a useful number? Yeah, of course it's a useful number because you're, you, you can do operations with it, but it's got nothing to do with the definition of the word number. Number means to count, okay? And infinity, same thing there, as you can see, you know, uh, you have uh, inf infinity in both directions, uh, negative and positive. Are those numbers? No, of course not. But, you know, uh, if you divide 1 divided by 0, you know, you get infinity. How do you get infinity? Well, uh, they figured it out, like I showed a minute ago, where, you know, if you divide 1 divided by 4, right, the number becomes smaller. If you divide it by 5, it becomes smaller. Bec divided by 100, it becomes even smaller. So the bigger you make your denominator, right, the bigger you make your denominator, the 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 um, um, smaller your your one is going to be, 
and likewise, you know, and so, so what you do is you get into this infinite uh, series. It's an infinite series. And so they had to put this sign, which they invented, you know, the, uh, the uh, figure eight, lying down figure eight. And they said, okay, so this is infinity. But infinity per se is not a number. It's just saying, oh, you're going to count incessantly. You can't use it in, in a real operation, at least nothing related to, to our reality. And the way they do this, you know, the way we do it normally, uh, especially in the industry, you round. You round off to two decimal points, that's it. And we let the mathematicians continue doing their own, <laughs> uh, finding all the uh, decimal points there, and they, they entertain themselves forever with that. Anyways, um, that's my starting point. Just wanted to give you an overview of numbers, and and uh, hopefully in the next uh, couple sessions, I'm going to go into uh, how these relate or how they were brought into physics. Okay, we ended up with singularity. Uh, what is a singularity? You know, well, again, you got to go to Mr. Schwarzschild, Schwarzschild, and he. Uh, he said, you know, you take this big mass, big mass, this, the star, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, shrink it, until all matter disappears because the mathematician doesn't care about structure. You end up with this very big mass, zero volume, which means infinite mass, essentially. Okay. And, uh, and now we have what is called, or what they call is a singularity. And they also have a different uh, notion of singularity where, you know, the laws of physics break down at the singularity because we don't know what happens after that. Great. Right. Anyways, they, 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 you know, what is that? And, uh, you know, it's very, very similar. The singularity is very, very similar to the point, to Euclid's point, who defined it as that which has no part. In other words, that which has no size, no, no volume, no anything. That's a point. What the uh, mathematicians, the contemporary mathematicians, uh, did, uh, Schwarzschild and uh, Einstein and so on, is they said, oh, yeah, it has no size, but it's got lots of mass. And now we can start doing something with that. <laughs> okay, so we'll see you on, uh, what is it, on Sunday, and we'll continue with, with our chat here. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.